Hello, everybody, and Hello. welcome to Coffee Class with Young Screenwriters. We are we an are online, a oh, yeah, online resource for screenwriters, <laughs> and today we're going to talk about outlining part two. First, last time we talked about um, act one and all of the elements of story that make up act one, and now we're going to talk about the tension point between objective and obstacles and mm -hmm. how that's sort of centered on midpoint in three-act structure for movies. So, and if we get, and if we do really that really quickly, we'll talk about act three, which is the second most important act. They're all important. But this one, this one is pretty freaking important. <laughs> They're all important, <laughs> yeah. but yes. So do you have that, whenever you're ready, Alexi, we could put that guide uh, um, we were using this last time, that Word document. The one from- Yeah, it's in the vault. Um, the vault, indeed. Yes. I'll grab that. But, and I'll do like a quick recap of um, act one for those who haven't been here. And if you really want to see, hear what we have to say, just watch the last video um, and you weren't here, but we're going to mostly cover act two, which is infamously the hardest act. It's the, it's the place in a story people burn out on in both novels and plays and uh, screenplays. And we're going to talk about our theories about, you know, why that happens in general, but also like sort of like practical sort of tips and guidelines for being like, okay, no, don't lose track of the promise of the story you started. It's easy to start a story. It's easy to lay the tracks of the story. So I'm going to go over act one really quickly. So, mm -hmm. and also I'm just going to be talking about uh, feature screenwriting for this um, pilots. You can use a very similar uh, structure. Uh, the only difference is that act three delivers full change um, rather than just opening up um, the promise of your show and the new world of your show. So like the focus is a little bit different, but you could still use like three act structure for uh, TV, but uh, we're gonna talk about features today. So mm -hmm. act one of your story, you want to fundamentally answer the baseline question of an, the average viewer, which is, okay, who's this about? Why should I care? And is what's going to happen next worth following? And we can organize those questions into these little elements that in this questionnaire, you would answer your, out yourself. This is our tent pole outline. So the protagonist, central character whose eyes we follow and they have the central change of the story, the emotional journey, their dramatic flaw and inner need, the flaw being the uh, lie they tell themselves in the beginning of the story that's integrated with their status quo and the inner need being the truth that sets them free that they discover on the way. They are not consciously aware of their inner need or really their fault flaw. These, this is a subconscious sort of dichotomy that's revealed through choices. Um, the Matic question is uh, you know, a great way of sort of adding depth and nuance to your story. We're sort of like, okay, if the story, if my story is about sort of X theme, how do the different characters in that world have a belief about that theme that is different. Like, um, you know, in a m movie that's about, uh, you know, education system, like, you could have a kid, somebody who believes, oh, school is bad and I hate it. Learning is evil. And somebody was like, oh, learning is the is the right way. Or, you know, like having different nuanced answers to the, the, a question. Um, right. And that's, uh, Lexi does a better spiel on that, but um, I'm just running <laughs> no. through it. And she did last time. Um, mentor. Doesn't have to be an old wizened man with all the answers who, you know, dies halfway through and then like flashes back meaningful, uh, you know, anecdotes or, you know, lessons, although it can be. The mentor is only a character who helps the protagonist find their inner need. That's all it is. And the inner need doesn't have to be, you know, cliche. It can be really specific and emotional and true to your story. The better your inner need flaw dynamic, the just the deeper you'll go. Whether you subconsciously articulate that or not, that is true. Um, Wait, um, say how it's a yeah. hat. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a <laughs> I have a metaphor I use uh, to sort of describe mentors um, and a lot of these roles. So the mentor is a hat a character can wear play. It's like a role they act out in the story. It's a function. It is not intrinsic to the character. Like you don't have to have a mentor character be like traditionally wise or an archetype of like the old man in the cave. It does not have to be that way. 
it can just be, it could be a rival classmate who just sort of gets the truth that the protagonist needs. It, and it can just be a moment. They, it could be the antagonist. Mm -hmm. It could be anything. It, it just has to be true to what your story is. Example that shall not be named, of course, <laughs> is definitely not Whiplash. Yeah, yeah, which has we, a mentor we, we're not antagonist. done talking about Whiplash. <laughs> done but talking about it. That's as an example, example of uh, a... Uh, mentor who doesn't look like a traditional mentor the way adam and i break up is we see the old man as the protagonist and we see russell as his mentor and a pretty significant obstacle at times but overall the little boy is the mentor and he does not look like a wise old wizard yeah. uh, or any of those things the reason why i keep bringing that up is that's like the the youngian ar archetype right and i think a lot oh, of people yeah. really have a strong um association with the word mentor um yeah for a false mentor can they be someone who is not intentionally trying to get in the way of the protagonist just incompetent yeah if that if that's true to the theme of your story um that's although the dad and whiplash yeah yeah that's right that's right that's a perfect example he he does not hold uh what's his name neiman's inner need neiman's inner need yeah. Dad doesn't. The dad is trying to get him to have like a more full life. And the journey that Andrew's on is that he is going to completely give up everything to drum. So when yes. the dad is there trying to like guide him and show him that like life is bigger than this, he's mechanically a false mentor because that's not the direction that Andrew's going on within yes. like the narrative structure of the story and, and i would also add specifically to this point of intention um I, I i personally believe about people in life that everyone believes their worldview is right right like if, if pretty much most people believe that if everybody else thought like they did the world would be a better place and a false mentor truly believes whatever it is they believe it just might be the wrong belief for the protagonist it might be entrenching further the lie the protagonist tells themselves that's not necessarily like intentional like i'm gonna fuck that guy up no 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 it can be like um yes go into debt go to law school you're not supposed to be a, a mime <laughs> you know you're not supposed to go you're not supposed to be a pastry chef you're supposed to go here and stay in law school with me i have all the right answers Right. You that can't can sing. Mentor. You're supposed to be a basketball star, Troy Bolton. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But yeah, people rarely do things because they think it's the wrong thing to do. Even if, um, dang it, that always happens to my freaking camera. It's when I accidentally touch it. It's all good. Um, but people rarely do things because they think it's the wrong thing to do. You know, they normally will have some sort of, they might know that parts of it are wrong, but they have some justifications yeah. for why it's why that is less important than whatever good they think they're doing. Um, and that's the same case with your characters. People rarely do things because it's because they believe it's the wrong thing to do. For sure. And um, moving on really quick, uh, self-sabotage. Uh, I, I see that more as sort of leaning into the flaw, right? If you think mm -hmm. of it as it's the, a lie the protagonist tells themselves about their world, it's a belief about their world that's self-destructive just believing and making choices by that flaw could be self-sabotaging. So it, again, it depends on your story and it depends on your flaw and your need. Um, Dang it, I did it again. <laughs> that's my take. Sorry, you're having camera issues, but um, just to get- I'm accidentally touching things. Just to get into act uh, two, I think a lot of people, everybody's pretty familiar with normal world, inciting incident and mm -hmm. call to action. But so I'm just going to go over normal world and inciting incident. Normal world is the status quo of the protagonist. The inciting incident is the single event that disrupts their status quo. So we meet them. We start to care about them. Oh, my God. Something sort of ch shakes things up. The protagonist is forced into action. And we have this little response period, which is usually like the protagonist grappling with how they're going to react to the inciting incident. But functionally, the thing that really matters is hitting that act one break, which we call a call to action which well, it, it's the call to action moment, but it happens on the act one break. That's that's the distinction. It's not the same thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's the moment the protagonist commits to their objective. 
this is arguably one of the most important moments of a story that people fuck up all the time. Sorry, mess up all the time. Much better. Where, yeah, thank you. We're, <laughs> not, we're not gonna get censored. Um, so incite, you've normal world status quo, inciting incident disrupts status quo and forces flawed protagonists into action. And because of that instability, they are forced to make a choice to commit to this objective. And the objective is usually a way to sort of rectify, the, uh, it's a repercussion, it's a reaction to the repercussions of the inciting incident. And we like to, we created this little, uh, this extra word here below, objective, motivation, as a field for people to get to sort of force themselves to actually come up with a tangible, specific, unattainable, important goal. Mostly when people fuck up going to act two, and we're now in the act two part of the conversation for people who want to start listening now. Um, this is a huge mistake people make because they think the motivation is the objective. Yep. Like give us an example, Alexi. So people do, I mean, the classic one is that people say, well, this character just wants love. He's trying to find love. And that's not an objective. That can be a motivation that he like wants to be loved, but his objective needs to be a specific manifestation of that. So that would be like a specific person. He wants to go on a date with this specific person. He wants to take this specific person to prom, something like that. He wants to kiss this person, whatever it is. Yeah. That's it's the manifestation of the motivation. So just three uh, and really fast examples. Um, Inception, or the one we always talk yep. about, is this really an easy movie to break down. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Inception, Cobb's motivation is to return to his children, yep. to become a father for them again, to come home. His objective is to succeed on the job, the job being Inception on Inception. Robert Fisher. Yeah. Right, so if he can plant in the whole act two, all of act two, most of act three, is designed around if he can achieve an inception in Robert Fisher without dying or without Saito dying, he will see his children again. But he, the, 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 the objective is the means to find the motivation. It is not the motivation. And they really made it tangible and specific because wasn't it that they had to put it inside of like a safe? Oh, they yeah, had to literally get these... was in a safe. Yep, that's yeah, right. Yeah, they, that's they right. made it super tangible, specific, unattainable, and important. and important. They made it a safe. So his yeah. objective was to incept Fisher by putting these numbers or whatever, the statement inside of a safe. That was the whole deal, right? And then, yeah. but his motivation was to get back to his kids. Um this realization to separate the two helped me break down so many movies that were otherwise messing with my brain, like Winter's Bone. Her motivation yeah. is she wants to keep the house. She wants to keep the house, keep her family together. Her objective is dad. She needs to get the dad. Um, and that used to really mess with my brain in particular was that one. Because I was like, well, what does she want? Because she wants the house. And this thinking about it it's two separate things really helps to pinpoint what's going on and it's important because the motivation is so connectly connected to the flaw inner need track and the objective is so connected to the plot track so like the, the physical action track that you need both and both need to be really really compelling but you can't you can't only have one you need both of them yeah. So this is where we pivot into act two and mm -hmm. act two is all about this. It's all about objective and stakes for objective. Yeah. So the environment of act two is the opposite of the status quo of the ordinary world. It is the moment they commit to their objective, the protagonist goes from the old world to the new world. And this is a real shift in energy where if you're paying attention and whether your act is 20 minutes, your act one is 20 minutes or 40 minutes, mm -hmm. <laughs> the moment it ends and moves into act two, the reason why there's a renewed surge of energy, if it's working well, is because we're moving into a new environment where 
protagonist is at going after objective. It's a huge like inertia um, push in a story. Um, and it's, I, I think so, it's kind of important to get there fast um, in general. So I just watched uh, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, I think is the full name of that movie. I really enjoyed it. And in that movie, the this moment is literally when he flies with his friend Katie from San Francisco to China. And mm. he leaves his old world and he goes into the new one. And that's the case with a lot of like big action adventure fantasy things is that you literally will leave your old world and go somewhere new and different that you've not really explored before. But it doesn't have to be that big. The important thing with the new world is that there's a significant change in the rules. The rules of the world are no longer yes. within the protagonist's comfort zone. So that could be something like if your movie is about student election, you're from the moment you commit and now you're like on the campaign trail, um, then that is going from like normal high school to like campaign, that's a significant rule change for now all of a sudden this world is new and the protagonist doesn't know how to navigate it yet. So that's that's the really key part about New World is the rules. For sure. And in the New World, the the nature of the scenes change changes. It becomes about protagonist pushing for obstacle in fact, protagonist pushing for objective, obstacle getting in the way, and then protagonist making choices, ideally. The best act twos hinge on choices and consequences. And we like to sort of um, use the, the the South Park writers, uh, you know, shorthand of being like, okay, line up all your stories into events and connect it with but or therefore, never and then. So Bob goes to the supermarket, but there's no milk. Therefore, yada, yada, yada. And if you can make that like a, uh, an escalating sort of, you know, ascension mm -hmm. as the stakes get higher, more meaningful, that's the art. So you're about, so you're trying to balance chasing objective with rising stakes and obstacles and choices. And this is the web that become that is like the real hard thinking. I think the hardest thing to card is act two because you never want to repeat like an event or obstacle that isn't raising the stakes, right? Like if you have three scenes happen back to back that are just kind of monotonous, you're, you're not like drawing people in. You're not at, you're not making them lean forward in their seat and be like, Oh my God, I want to know what happens next. And, uh, you know sorry, what I, Lexi, want? You say I want a whiteboard so I can draw things and hold it up to answer this question from Chris. Oh, okay. What's, uh, <laughs> but, what, yeah, basically, it's just it's the question about um, what about those situations where they don't get what they thought they wanted, but presumably they get what they need. You know, yeah, like that's where, act three. That's act three, yeah. right? So like, and yeah, and the objective lives in act two. Yes, and I think that that's something that was really really clarifying for me that the objective doesn't exist fully in act one it's like what breaks us into act two act two is like consistently and thoroughly about pursuing the objective if and act you two, have a, if you have the objective being pursued in act one you're fucking up mm -hmm. the reason is that you're not spending time making people really care about who the person is and what their situation is and you can have a really short act one i've seen act ones that are as short as 15 pages to 20 pages I think you want enough time to give people a sense of like who a person is and what their problems are. But um, act two is about the objective. And there are so many stories where objective sort of stops Matt. Star Wars is a perfect example. It shifts into a brand new objective in act three. Yep. It's act two is all about delivering those droids to the rebels. And there are escalating obstacles. One, okay, the droids, the, the stormtroopers are looking for us in the town. We've got to get a ship fast. Okay, we don't have a lot enough money. Okay, we'll make a deal with this guy who's maybe not that great. Okay, we're on the ship. TIE fighters are, oh no, not yet, but like, we're on the ship. And, oh shit, is that a moon? Where's the planet? 
oh my God, the planet got blown up and now we're getting sucked into a tractor beam to be sucked into a giant uh, space station run by the bad guys and our ship is trapped. Oh shit, like it's accelerating, accelerating, accelerating. But all of all of that is underpinned by get droids to rebels. Get yep. droids to rebels. And the moment they deliver the droids after Obi-Wan dies and they chase off the um, TIE fighters, they finally deliver the rebels and they find it the Death Star schematics. The, the that objective becomes completely meaningless. And the last 20 to 30 minutes of the movie become, oh shit, we're gonna die right now if we don't blow this thing up. Mm -hmm. So the way that we really explain that is sometimes you have objectives that are corrupted by your flaw, and which is a common thing that you see in movies. You have objectives that are corrupted by the protagonist's flaw. They want the wrong thing, they want the thing that's not gonna emotionally. Help or them the right thing a, for the wrong reasons. Or sometimes. the right yeah. thing for the wrong reasons. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, it tends to be one of those in almost every case, I would say. Um, because they're pursuing the objective. And so if it's the case that they're pursuing a corrupt objective, then typically what... Um, then typically what happens is um, at the end of Act 3 your protagonist will always come face to face with their objective. And if it's a corrupt one, then they tend to get it at the end of act two, moving into act three. And then they realize it's not what they really want. And they have a new little mini goal. So that would be like the woman was wanted the promotion. So, 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 so bad all throughout act two, she gets it at the end of act two and then her all is lost moment, which we will get to, is that she realizes that in the process, she has lost everything. She's lost all of her friends and family and everything. She's completely cut everybody off. And then now she has a new goal to satisfy her inner need by running back and getting back in time for Christmas or something. You know, and it's like one of those types of things where you realize that the objective was corrupt when you resolve the flaw. The other option is that you, I, I think the wanting it for the wrong reasons, Adam, do you want to explain that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, so in Toy Story, Woody, when he um, is ostracized from his community for trying to get rid of Buzz and he's separated in the move, he is tasked with the objective. You have to bring Buzz back to Andy. And yeah, that's the right objective for his inner need. But he he is doing it feet dragging. He's like, oh shit, I've got to do this to be accepted back again. <laughs> but I'm going to show them all what an idiot he is. I'm going to get back to my place. And this guy is just an impediment. And they go, he goes from that to they become best friends. Right? Like, But the objective doesn't change even after his inner need. Like it's bring Buzz back. It's just the total emotional reality of that goal has shifted. Um, that's a good example, I think. Um, yeah, I think so too. And just moving into, um, we have the terms antagonist and friends and enemies here. You can introduce both of these things in act one, but you have to at least introduce these things in um, act two. I will say friends are usually in act one, but sometimes it's cool to be like, oh, you meet a new person. You meet Han Solo at the Mos Eisley bar after they've committed. You know, it's sometimes having a new character come in right at the act, uh, act break and from act one to act two is a great way to sort of push more energy into the story, especially if that person is an obstacle. <laughs> uh, so mm -hmm. that's one way to frame it. An antagonist, the way I define antagonist is they impede the objective of the of the uh, protagonist. Either it's a mutually exclusive goal, like they want to blow up the world, you know, before the protagonist pushes the button that saves the world, or, um, you know, they want the same thing and they, they, they both can't have it. Or the antagonist, it could be anything that as long as it's a strong emotional motivation to stop the protagonist from achieving their objective. I mean, Darth Vader in Star Wars doesn't even know Luke exists. Mm -hmm. until like halfway through like he's impeding them he's trying to stop he's trying to get the droids 
it doesn't have to be a, oh, I hate you. It's, it can be really, as long as we understand the antagonist is an obstacle and not just a, like one obstacle in the story, but like the significant personification of the obstacles and the emotional reality of that. Um, there's so much variation with, with, with what you can do. Like you can have the antagonist be a likable person. Which is fun. Yeah. Make them right. Make them have like, a, oh shit, they got, they've got a point. Well, I think that's why people liked Thanos as much. As, I think that that's why he's yeah, become such sure. a like iconic villain is because you're like, oh man, he, I mean, his, his conclusion's a little wrong. But his like analysis of the problem is correct, and I can understand how he got to where he got, even though that's a little bit psycho. I still get it. And the the thing that I saw this on Twitter, which is like lately, there's been a trend in superhero movies that the antagonist wants to solve a problem that's a legitimate problem, but wants to do it in a violent way. And the superhero's job is just to stop them from doing it in the violent way. Don't actually have a solution to the problem that they're trying to solve. So, like, the Avengers are trying to stop Thanos, but they don't have a solution for the fact that there's too many people and not enough resources. They're just trying to stop him because they think that his, uh, his, uh, that his approach is wrong. Yeah, just a little yeah. wrong, Michelle. Just a little. <laughs> Honestly, I thought he was great. I thought that chin, I was like, he was very dreamy. You could talk to that, that all day. Oh, wow. Um, wow. So That's an opinion. the thing that I think is important is to divide act two into two pieces, just to be mm -hmm. more manageable, just so you can have more clarity. The, the, the middle of your film, or just after the middle of your film, you want to have built up to your mid, what we call the midpoint. And up to this point, you want the stakes to continually being raised all the way until you reach this midpoint. So the protagonist is going after their objective. They're having obstacles that are increasing in, in internal and external stakes. But when they reach the midpoint, this is a great opportunity to have a fundamental game changer. The better your midpoint, the better your, your story is. And I think a lot of people have soft midpoints that are kind of weak. Um, and, and I think like really just fundamentally cause not just a setback, but like one that changes the dynamic of the problems they have. So like if they're all having spaceship battles for the first half of act two, the midpoint, maybe their ship gets taken up and they land in a desert and oh my God, what the fuck are they gonna do? They don't have any supplies, but they've got to get to the thing. Like the nature of the problems and the environment. That's why we call it new, new world sometimes. Second half of back two. Um, yep. I, I, I would define midpoint that simply. It's just a huge setback that changes the dynamic. Yeah, it's like you've gotten used, cause like at the very beginning you were comfortable in your original world. You were comfortable in the normal world. Then at the beginning of back two, you get thrust into this new world where all the rules have changed. And then you have obstacle, obstacle, obstacle. It feels like you're getting some traction. Like it feels like, okay, things are going good. I feel like I feel like I could get my objective right now. And then the world throws you a curveball at the midpoint. And it puts them back at ground zero. And typically the rules change. So that could be like an ally dies. Or like an ally turned out to be a traitor. Or... I mean, just like any, like it turns out to be more complicated than, than they thought. I'm trying to think of what the midpoint was in Shang-Chi. I just watched it last night though. So I wasn't breaking it as I watched it, but uh, I think, oh, the midpoint of Winter's Bone was that she found out that he is dead. Yes. Right. Which totally changes the dynamic of her problems. Mm -hmm. Cause she's trying to find her dad. Midpoint, she finds out that dad is surely dead, uh, but she still needs to find his body in order to satisfy the objective and the motivation. So it's it's a big rule change at that point. But, 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 in general, the midpoint does not change what the actual objective is. 
you don't want to do like a bait and switch. It should be like essentially the same thing, but maybe like more nuanced or like slight shift. Like she was going to find the dad alive. Now he's going to find him dead. It's not a different objective. Does that, does that make sense? Makes total sense. Um, One of John's big things is keep your objective consistent. Keep it consistent throughout the entire, the entirety of act two. Um, even if like, stakes and circumstances around it change a lot of times there's something like at the midpoint now there's a ticking clock like the bad guys on to them now it's going to be like they're gearing up to launch the rocket and if we don't get there like now it's going to be different and there's a big setback and blah 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 um so yeah yeah so um main act break and I well, one thing I want to say before we go and go on is I was talking about choices earlier. The ch this is kind of like your watermark for how interesting and meaningful and engaging your story is, is to ask yourself, okay, what are the meaningful choices and how can I make obstacles? Sorry. How can I make obstacles out of consequences from those choices? Like really like loop back. What was something the protagonist did at the beginning of act one at the, at the beginning of act two and how can at the end, second half of Act Two, kind of a consequence come back? Like that's that's really where you start making powerful associations and can, doing that sort of connective tissue that's really like engaging and rewarding. But you want your problems to, the, by the end of Act Two, the emotional intensity of what's happening has to feel like the highest point of the movie so far. Like the mm -hmm. stakes, the emotional stakes, the philosophical stakes, and the external stakes have to be extremely high by the end of act two. Like you can't uh, be going like this. You want it to feel like a slope. Maybe the midpoint is a drop. I don't know. Or the midpoint changes the way, but the end of act two has to feel like a high point um, that turns into the lowest point um, thus far. The thing about the ultimate test we like to talk about it is that this is a moment, the most important thing to get across is that this is the moment your protagonist becomes aware of their flaw and the inner need. Like this mm -hmm. forces them. Not necessarily they don't change it right away, but like this is the moment that forces them into the all is lost. And I think of the ultimate test and the all is lost as two sides of the same coin. Like yes. the all is lost is fallout from the ultimate test. Absolutely. And a lot of times this is, is uh, the protagonist makes the wrong choice. Yep. Because of their flaw. And choice is what's important. They make the they make a wrong choice because of their flaw, and they lose because of it. The ultimate test is always an emotional loss. Um, yeah. yeah, that's absolutely true. It's the moment where, by this point, the audience knows that the protagonist is going to like. They're they're like no don't mess it up, don't mess it up. And they, you know that they are. Like, you know that they're going to make the wrong choice here. And they oh, and they do. Because this is, their, this is the last moment where their flaw really Fs them and pushes them to their lowest point. So it doesn't necessarily mean it looks like a loss, but this is what we were talking about before, where if your objective was to get the promotion, but your inner need has to do with, like, appreciating like realizing that family is more valuable than money and like your family will love you even if you don't get the promotion and all this stuff um in this moment you might have a situation where the protagonist is in the taxi and has to tell the taxi driver where they're gonna go and they can either go to the kids dance recital or they can go to the office and then they'll surely get the promotion if they go to the office but they have to choose and since it's the ultimate test, they're going to suffer an internal loss due to their flaw. They're going to choose the office. They're going to go to the office. They're going to get the promotion. And it's still going to be an emotional low because they're going to realize in this moment, the moment right after the all is lost, they're going to finally understand their flaw and how much it's effed with them. And that the thing that they thought they wanted was ultimately empty and doesn't satisfy them. Um, I hope that that makes sense. So that's that's one in which they do get the objective, but it's still an internal loss. And then the other one is that they don't get the objective because of 
who they are. Um, does that make sense? Like, that makes perfect sense it, to me. It might be like that they've been trying to, I don't know, date somebody. The romance ones are kind of easier sometimes to explain, but like they've been trying to date somebody this whole time and they finally are going to like go on this date with them, but like their, their flaw, their selfishness or something ruins it at the last minute. And now they don't get their goal. Um, and it makes them finally confront. I think it happened in a social network. Right? I don't remember that movie. Um, but It's because he got, Zuckerberg <laughs> got everything. I the first everything. 15 minutes because I've seen the first 15 minutes like 20 times. But yeah. like I saw the movie once and it was like, okay. I think it was that Zuckerberg got everything he wanted, but he lost all of his friends. Right. And and so that was the one like where he realizes he get he gets the objective, but it's not what he what he needed. And just to go back to examples we always talk about, but Inception, I think a lot of people miss the ultimate test, but it is very clearly they're at the final level of the dream. They've got you know the stakes have never been higher they're they're almost there robert fisher's just outside the safe cobb's got his sniper uh, re, uh his what's it called sniper rifle aimed he's he's covering for robert fisher and right before robert fisher gets to the door mal who is the personification of his uh guilt over killing his wife and his inability to let go of the past and tell the dream from the reality comes up and is about to shoot Robert Fisher and um, Ariadne, the mentor, goes over to um, uh, Cobb, forgetting the character's names, and says, wait, can't you see? Like, it's not real. She's not real. And he says, you, you don't know that? He makes the wrong choice. He loses it and he hesitates. And he could have killed her and succeeded, but he hesitates. And that choice causes Robert to get killed and then Saito, and then they have to go into limbo and everything's fucked. Um, yeah. And then I was still trying to think about in, in Shang-Chi what it was. And I, I was, it, so. again, going to have to watch it again. But there's definitely like this whole, this like fight thing in the end that's very typical like action situation where they face the, the big bad and they're not ready to do whatever it takes in that moment like they're not fully committed then he's like nearly dead and he gets like motivated to try again and then he goes to a different approach and fights either like the real big bad and they're like joined up <laughs> either way it's one of those situations um uh, just to talk about the movie that shall not be named uh whiplash <laughs> but it has a great ultimate test in the sense of he has a moment of sanity right it's the it's after the car crash so the car crash, his head's bleeding. He's walking to the session. Sorry if you haven't seen the movie, it's great. Um, he's walking to the gig. He's five minutes late. or He he, ha he left his drumsticks in the car, for that was what it was. But he's bloodied, going over to the drum kit. He's so out of balance. And the moment he makes a choice happens when uh, he basically punches... Um, Fletcher in the face says, you're, you're an asshole. I can't put up with this anymore, which is strangely enough, his dad's voice, the false mentor. It's in the end of the story, he ultimately embraces the imbalance and self-destructiveness, but it's a moment where he's so destructive that he lashes out and says, no, I'm not going to do this. And the all is lost moment. He, uh, what he does is he calls a lawyer to get Fletcher fired. And that's the all is lost moment is when he quits and all of that stuff. Wild. What a, we need to start talking about, uh, what is it? Black Swan instead of whiplash sometime. I haven't seen it in forever. Black Swan's got some good moments. I don't think it's <laughs> as good of a movie. I like it's, it's, uh, I liked whiplash more. I didn't, I didn't love black Swan because I, I, there was a few like the fingernail moments. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I don't like it. Yeah, for me, Ugh. the thing that got me was the bird leg thing. <sighs> and it was just suddenly like, yeah, yeah. I mean, Ugh. clearly uh, it was working as a horror film. Um, Ugh. No. <laughs> I don't like it. 
but yeah um oh that reminds me we need to take a peek at that you've had the list the wga like top films of whatever oh and, yeah we can go up to that after this but um yeah i don't think it's like a definitive list but i think it has a lot of great examples of films that are good reference films and we can start pulling from sure. that <laughs> let's go into act three here so we have the ultimate test that this is the moment where the protagonist either gives up on the objective or the objective becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The all is, and I don't mean gives up or like, it could be like, oh, it seems impossible. We're never going to win. You know, it, it's, it's, this is, this is a moment where we've reached a peak of energy and we go to a trough. We go, we go to a low point. Um, this is a moment where if you're doing your job right, there's an earned emotional moment where the protagonist realizes that they realize the lie they've been telling themselves and choose to commit to the truth um, that, that will set them free, which is the inner need. And there's a really hackneyed cliche way to do that. And then there's a great way that's aspirational and emotional. And that's up to the, have you been doing a good job up to this point? Um, did the did the director miscast? I don't know, you know. <laughs> One sec, but, I have um, to make sure my laptop is plugged in. Oh, no worries. But what happens after the, the trough of the all is lost moment is a recommitment. Um, this can either be to, uh, it's, a, it's a recommitment, not necessarily to the old objective, although it can be. What's important is it's a recommitment to the truth that was, that sets them free, right? So like if they realize that, gosh, I really was an evil stockbroker and I need to spend time with my family, the all or nothing moment is where they start to prove they've embraced their need by making choices they would have never made in act one. So that's kind of the litmus test for, do you have a good fly in your need transformation? Pokemon the movie. Pokemon the movie. I don't remember it. I just remember that at the all is lost. Oh, Ash, Ash dies. Ash is rock. And Brock. <laughs> that too. But Ash is a rock and Pikachu's tears revive him at the all or nothing and then we go into the final fight so that was uh uh what an I iconic film love pokemon the movie so what was the choice they made that they would have never made earlier i guess pikachu wouldn't have cried over ash or something i don't know i feel like he would have <laughs> i feel like he would have too i feel like it was probably <laughs> i think it was something about like mewtwo was trying to separate like break up the bonds between Pokemon and the trainers. Uh, and Pikachu was like, no. Ah, this is a great question. So I'm going to get into Final Fight for a minute. So uh, Maxim, um, can you bring up that question? Yep. Okay, so n there's one missing piece here. So to simplify, the end of Act 2, the ultimate test, is a choice a decision enforced by the flaw. Mm -hmm. It's not just any decision. It's a choice that, that is self-destructive, that is embodied by their flaw, that has defined them up until this point in the story. So it's not just a decision, but it's a decision infused with the flaw, followed by a failure. And it's a failure that forces them to embrace their inner need. Yep. Like this is the heart of a movie, this moment right here. Yep. And the decision... It's not just a decision. This is the sequence called the all or nothing can be a series of like 12 decisions very fast. It's, it's a, I'd like to think of it as a sequence where the protagonist commits to their inner need and they start making choices by their need. So it's not just a decision. This is, this can be, um, it can be one page. It can be 15 pages. Like there's a lot of variation. Between Sometimes it's like, nothing. Sometimes it's like the protagonist is knocked down. They think they're going to lose. And then like they see a picture of their child and they remember why they have to do this fight and they get like roused yeah. to go fight again. Or it can be something much more complicated. But so, I have a new example, the matrix. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the, the all or nothing of act three of the matrix is best embodied by the subway fight scene. It's uh, Trinity and Morpheus escape via the phone, and the moment the, they escape, the phone gets shot, and 
and Neo's stuck. And the whole part of the movie, he's been told, if you see an agent, you have to run. It's a death sentence. You have to run. And he makes a choice. I'm not going to run. I can do it. I'm the one, all of that stuff. You know. But like he ch- makes a choice not to run. This is in the all or nothing. He's embraced his inner need, sort of. And he's and he fights the agent in a way he'd never fought before. And he actually beats it. It's like a 15 minute sequence. And then it's less than that. But then after that, when he when the agent's dead and he comes off the subway and there's another agent, he starts running. He's like, okay, fuck, I got to get out of here. Got to escape. But it's the emotional reality is what's important. Like, yeah. He ran, he ran, but it was, he still had a victory. He still proved that the, that he's changed. And there's a sequence where he's running. He's trying to find the phone booth, trying to, the sequence, the the stakes are higher and higher than ever before. The robots are encroaching in the real world. They're about to kill everybody. Neo's only got like five minutes to answer the landline. And the moment he opens the door to the landline, gunshot. Agent Smith shoots him. And this is the final fight. The final fight's a two-minute sequence at best, two to three minutes. And Agent Smith shoots him like eight times, and he's he's dying. He dies. And, and, and there are better final fights, but like basically how it works is he dies. Everybody's like, oh, my God, that's impossible. Um, uh, Trinity kisses Neo and says, get up. I believe in you. You're the one. And he chooses to get up. Uh, decisive action. I think she has the decisive action in this situation because this was her character arc. The fact that she couldn't tell him that she really loved him and all that stuff. Very corny. But um, it worked because the action scenes were great. But um, the unexpected success is that he can't just, um, you know, dodge bullets. He stops the bullets altogether with his mind. Mm. And he doesn't just kill the agent. He overwrites their code by jumping inside them and obliterates their existence. So I want to do like the psych analysis of what's happening here yeah so because i find that interesting and it helps me to think about things for sure so we've last time we talked about how psychologically people don't want to change we have deeply rooted flaws to shield ourselves from an inner need because we don't have it and it's very very sensitive and it's very, very raw. So this, the flaw is a shield that your character is putting up to defend their inner need. And it's really, really sensitive. It's a core part of who they are. It's a huge vulnerability. And people will go through their life. Like, if you think about your life as a movie, you probably have not gone through this arc more than a few times. Like, when's the last time you truly changed your opinion on something that really matters? It doesn't happen a lot. And so this is, we're looking at what does it take to get a person to the point that they'll have a life-changing shift in belief in how they see the world and things like that. And so at the ultimate test, this is the moment where the protagonist's flaw is going to do the worst thing it could possibly do to them. It is going to be, like, if you're trying to decide, like, what would the ultimate test be for my, char- my character, and maybe their their belief is, Adam, give me a, give me a flaw. Something, it's a random belief. I can never love mind. because my dad left me. I can never love because my dad left me. So what is the worst thing that a person could do? Because they hold this belief. Like what is the absolute worst thing that they could do. Is like probably. My my initial thought is that. Fallen in love with someone who has a kid. Yeah. And they leave. Because they say. I can never love because my dad left me. And they're making it worse. By also leaving this kid. And then he gets the kids right. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so it's, it's a just terrible like, adoption movie <laughs> so it's just like it's like literally we're going to put them in the position where their flaw is going to make them make the worst decision that they could possibly make and it is going to wreck them it's going to put them at their lowest point their rock bottom which is the always lost because people don't tend to change until they get to their rock bottom it just doesn't tend to happen with things like this um, I mean, that's even a thing in like 
and like AA and NA and things like that. People talk about like you hit rock bottom before you change when you're already like that deeply invested in things. It's like the same thing. They're all as lost as you're putting them at the rock bottom. So they have no choice to confront their flaw head on and realize what their inner need is. They, they realize, oh yeah, humans totally work. That, that's like the whole thing that I think with stories. That that's I why, think are that's so, why stories work. Is that I think this is completely about just like how people are. And this is just like the expression of that within a 90 minute span. And so in this all is lost moment, they have no choice but to reckon with their flaw and realize what their inner need is. Like realize like my flaw has made me so completely miserable. I have lost all. All is lost. And I have no choice now but to realize my inner need and overcome this flaw. And that's the decision that they make at the end of the all is lost moment that all then the next thing they do is all or nothing. It's their commitment to satisfying their inner need because they just discovered what their inner need was. They just realized that their flaw effed them up. Now they're going to take a step that they would have never taken if they didn't know what their inner need was. So if we go back to like the AA, NA comparison, you get to the rock bottom. That's the all or nothing might be like, all right, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go to a meeting or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, it's the moment where now you know what you want. You're going to take a step that you would have never taken before because you didn't even know that that's what you wanted. You didn't know that that's what you needed. And then that leads us into the final fight, which is this, what Adam is saying, it's a short sequence. It tends to be like three to four pages max. There's a really, really fast boom, boom, boom moment where now they've committed to their inner need. They're going to pursue the inner need. And right out of the gate, there's a catastrophic failure. I'm going to keep going with the AA thing because I can. It's a setback that makes it look like resolving their flaw wasn't enough. Like maybe they get to the meeting and people are like, no, like you can't be here or something like you're, I don't know. Or they like think that maybe they're going to drink again. something, something really, really catastrophic that kind of comes out of left field and makes it look like the effort they did wasn't going to be enough. Maybe it's that like their family is like, I don't care that you went. It's too late. It's too late for us. And now, and then, so there's the catastrophic failure. Then then the protagonist takes an action that they can only do because they've resolved their flaw. This is an action that they could have never done at any point sooner in the film at all. It's something that they can only do because of the fact that they've changed. And then they succeed and it tends to be more narratively interesting if they succeed in an unexpected way. But in, basically, it's just come up against something where it looks like the change wasn't enough. They hit their rock bottom. They committed to change. They took that first step. And it doesn't, it's not easy. There's still resistance. So they have to do one more big push, one more decisive action that they could have never done before. And then they break through and they have some sort of an unexpected success. So I can answer this question. This is a great question, actually. Um, so... I just I don't get why they have to fail so uh, fail so low again, even though the flaw is gone. So think about the most exciting movie experiences you've ever had, the most emotional, the ones that like just dazzled you, and maybe start to think of metaphor to describe what that experience was as like the most exciting sports game you've ever seen in your life, where the stakes are so high. There's like two minutes on the clock, and they've got a the, the climax of the most exciting sports game you've ever seen in your life. And, you know, somebody drops, uh, I'm using football an analogy, even though I hate football. Somebody fumbles the ball at the last second and somebody grabs it, the team you're rooting for, and they're running. They dodge past 18 people. They're almost there. There aren't 18 people in the sport. I'm, I'm really fucking this up. But the point is, right before they're about to win, it seems like they're about to fail. Oh, my God, is he not going to make it? And then they make it. And it's more exciting oh. than if you just had wins wow i really had to deal with my dad daddy issues now let's just watch me win for 30 minutes 
<laughs> yeah. It's like, so I'm going to use an example that's near and dear to my heart. It was a UK UNC basketball game in Rupp Arena. Uh, and it started off looking pretty bad. We were going to lose to a team that we're not supposed to lose to in our own house. It was very oh, no. sad. And then all of a sudden, like around like halfway point, things start changing. Things start picking up. We start looking like we're going to do good. But then we get the scores pretty much neck and neck. And the clock is running down. And UNC has the ability to win if they make this shot. Right? And this whole time, our Anthony Davis, who, if you know basketball, he's a very, very good shot blocker. But he was still, like, figuring out things and he wasn't necessarily like who he is now but so the UNC had the ball they had one more chance to make the shot they got all the way up into the paint it looked like they were gonna do it they shot it it looked like it was gonna go in and Anthony Davis came out of nowhere with his decisive action and just knocked it down and it was an unexpected success because it was just like he was winning with the signature with this signature move and it happened right after the catastrophic failure if we let the person get all the way in and then they took the shot and it was going to go in and then he took a decisive action and it was an unexpected success we won and it was so it's clearly it mattered to me it was very intense and it's one of the only games that i remember that vividly so yeah it's a story in your head <laughs> in your mind it's a story we're yeah. repeating um, the short answer is it's just more exciting. Um, dynamics, contrast is interesting, right? Um, if you have the protagonist, you know, for the last 30 minutes of the movie has embraced their inner need and they're starting to make choices they would have never made and they're succeeding and succeeding. The final moment where they have to prove it like beyond a shadow of the doubt. And this is the moment that gives all of the catharsis for the audience. If you just make it an easy win, there's no stakes. If you make it like a, you know, nail biting last minute failure and then like prove it, it just, it's just, this is a mechanism to create extreme dynamics in your act three. You can totally not do this. This is just a way to approach it. You don't have to do this. I just think it's a great way to describe the best final fights. Um, so sort of like in Shang-Chi when they finally got them dragon beasts fighting and stuff. And then the other beast was trying to take the soul of the dragon and it looked like it was going to succeed. The sister was going to get torn away. They'd done everything right. They fixed everything. And then really one could almost say that Katie was the protagonist because she takes the, sh she makes a, dis a decisive action to take the shot and trust herself and there's an unexpected success. So it's like they've been fighting this whole time. It looks like they were finally getting some momentum. They're almost there. And then all of a sudden, there's this huge catastrophic failure. It looks like they're going to lose. Quick punch. It tends to happen really, really fast. Yes, it's going to be my new one. I love it. I just watched it last night, though. So it's also just fresh in my head. But it's like it's... It's not like another thing that's as low as all is lost. It's like you come face to face with it and there's one more little test that's just going to make you prove that you've changed is really what it does. Yeah, It's like you hit your low point, you change, you go to do something and then narratively you're going to be forced to prove that you've changed because something's going to go wrong and you're going to have to act as the new person that you are in order to overcome it. And that, yeah. And that tends to be how the most memorable stories go. It doesn't mean that this is like always the exact flow. I know that this seems really, really specific about like the catastrophic failure, decisive action, then unexpected success. Like that's, this is probably the, the third act is the moment where we have the most beats that are like very specific back to back out of this whole tentpole document. It's like the most nitpicky we get is within the final fight saying that these three sub beats sh should happen there. But it's a really I just think natural. it's a platonic ideal. Like it's just yeah. really a good way of doing it. I, I don't see many other high impact variations mm -hmm. um, 
that are just fundamentally different. Like they're all kind of versions of this. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's something that tends to happen naturally when writing a dramatic scene is that yeah. they, they come, they come out of the gate, something goes wrong, they overcome it, they win. <clears throat> and it's all really quick. It was like, you have the Buzz Lightyear Woody thing where they're finally going to fly together. Right. But it's then they the, come. Yeah. The, the, the uh, catastrophic failure, if you remember Toy Story, is they're on the, the, uh, what's it called the remote control car and they're almost the they're almost back to their friends they've overcome so much they've overcome sid they've overcome the rocket the rockets on buzz's back and they're they're both strapped to this little remote control car and it runs out of batteries and the truck starts going away and it's this moment of failure where like woody's like oh shit we're not gonna make it and he starts crying on the pavement and he decides to he sees the sunlight reflecting on buzz's helmet you know and lights the rocket and that's the size of action he would have never taken earlier collaborating with buzz and they have their and their emotional arcs both cascade at the same moment during the unexpected success while he lights the rocket that explodes you know he presses a buzz presses his button uh for his wings which cuts the tape and they fall with style together um mm -hmm. which is the unexpected success because we didn't think that uh we didn't think that he, Buzz was ever going to get to fly because that was part of the whole deal was that Woody kept being like, you're just a toy and blah, yeah. blah, blah. The, the, the key is to never lose track of the emotional reality of the characters. So the flaw inner need dynamic, you you just know, don't lose track of that. Like there, if you have, there's so many bad final fights that are completely devoid of a decisive action tied to inner need. It's sort yeah. of like, and then he just kills them. Great. And they save the world. It was like, well, okay, but like, what did that have to do with his daddy issues? Yeah. <laughs> you know? it has to be well, and that's why, that's why I think it's so important to think about, I have a flaw for this character. What is the worst thing that this could yeah. make them do? And then how, what tangible specific thing can get them into the position where they do that? Right. And yeah. then that's your objective. And so you can build a story that way and make sure that these two tracks are as overlapped as possible. Like we've talked about before how Die Hard, it does have the emotional inner need flaw track yeah. and it does have the objective stakes plot track, but they barely touch each other. They barely touch each other. He gets like a random call from his wife and then resolves it. And there's like yeah. this whole thing outside of accidentally like hurting a kid and blah, blah, blah. And they're, they could exist in two different movies. It feels like someone just cut them out and taped them together, right? But I think that you end up getting much more compelling stories with like an actual emotional catharsis, not just like a good time, when those two tracks are so interwoven that you can't set them apart. Pixar is masterful at this. Like there is never an, a third act in a good Pixar movie. They're, they're bad ones. The Good Dinosaur, for example. Um, but um, <laughs> but they're like in the best of the Pixar movies, it always feels integrated. The final fight is always about inner need. Mm -hmm. And this is a great time to plug our course writing the feature, which oh, yeah. is literally this, but really in depth. Think about 10 hours of video content, 12 weeks. It's great. And personal um, feedback from Adam. Yeah, and, and personal feedback from me on log lines and outlines. Um, if you haven't taken it, you should. People like it. It is. Um, we did it with NYU professor, with my old professor from NYU Tisch. Oh, yeah. John He's Warren. leading the course. Yeah. We're He's leading the course. It's, it's his course. We're TAs. And basically, he was my professor for four years and was just absolutely amazing and is everybody's favorite screenwriting teacher uh, in NYU film. And did this thing with him where we got him to just basically do his class and yep. even better me and Adam got to interrogate him to find out exactly what he meant about every single part and like really get as much out of him as we could um and we put it into a course and we did the math at one point <laughs> like if you took this course at NYU like I did it was like 27 grand pretty depressing Pretty, pretty freaking depressing. But yeah, we, 
Uh, we do not charge 27 grand. No. Fortunately and unfortunately, I suppose. But anyway, um, you can check that out if you would like. But the other thing... If everybody who's already is, taken it, then, you know, sorry yeah. for boring you. Uh. <laughs> Sally, um, but the other common mistake, John would say the most common mistake that he sees is this objective motivation mix-up and people believing that you can change your objective halfway through. John, hands down, always, when I ask him what the most, when you ask him what the most common mistake is, it's objective. It's that people don't pick specific, tangible, unattainable, important objective and then pursue it for the entirety of Act 2. And it's why and, people fuck up by Act 2. And it, and it is, because if you have something to chase, you have a direction you can go, you won't get lost in Act 2. But if you don't have that, then Act 2 just becomes a freaking slog where you don't know which direction you're going to go. It's 60 pages of, well, maybe now they go do this. But if you have that objective defined, then you have a much easier time. And the thing that we added to try to really emphasize this was we said, okay, let's separate motivation from objective to help people really highlight the difference between that most common mistake. Because the most common mistake was making the objective and motivation was making it like emotional and then that's when people got lost in act two because they weren't going towards anything and uh so hopefully we've addressed that i would say the number one reason why people still make mistakes but it looks very intuitive is that a lot of people resent the planning process there's like a lot of people who just want to like wing it um, or like have parts of it planned, but haven't quite thought it all out and just get, get antsy and want to. It's also extremely hard. It is hard. It looks easy. But then like, once you actually start trying to find all the different pieces and making sure that they work together, it's difficult. I know that like I share a tent pole with Adam and I'm like, this is pretty freaking good. And then he's like, wait, but what about, what about this part? And then I'm sort of like, man, hope you, universal hope for you everybody. wouldn't notice that. Right. Like <laughs> everybody feels like their first like stab at something. Like the, the, the first swell of inspiration is like, oh my God, I breathed new life into something. This is awesome. But you haven't scrutinized the fault lines and mm -hmm. ironed out the details, right? Like the first blush of an idea is always so appealing. Um, but that's why it's so important to A, um, have a process you trust, take your time with ideas, let them grow and interrogate mm -hmm. them. Don't just rush into an idea half baked and then it's just half baked. Um, I think my the biggest thing people mess up in screenplays is they just don't do the work. And I mean the work in the sense of like asking those good questions, like grounding it back in audience, right? Like remember that this is, remember that there are actors who are going to be acting out these lines, that these are gonna be performance opportunities that my uh, uh, grandmother would watch it and be like, who's this about? Why does this matter? <laughs> yeah. What's happening? Right, in the yeah. first 10 minutes, and she will turn it off if she doesn't know those things. If she doesn't have a character to latch onto, she doesn't care about them. That's, that's, that's life. And I will say too, that I think that part of why this looks easy is because it's, in my humble opinion, one of the most clearly articulated ways to look at story. And it, it wasn't, we're great, but it also wasn't by accident. It was that when John was in like film school, they were, he talks about how they were constantly just telling him like what's, what headlines, like what scene headings look like. Like that was the extent of his screenplay knowledge and it was driving him nuts. And so he'd go to their library and he would get scripts and a, a legal pad probably. Yeah. Right. And he would go through and he would write down the things he noticed, like the story beats that he noticed. And he would just do that all the freaking time until this came out of it. Until he figured out this way to articulate it. And then he had like a loose version of this that we would talk about in class. And I got really, I get really obsessive. So I would start like every single one, I would write down all the things that he talked about in this format. And that's how I would plan all of my writing. And it really, really helped me. And I didn't realize it was weird. And then 
as we started building things out, Adam looked at it, we looked at it again with John. We started realizing places that like things could be tweaked or improved or made more clear. And like that's where motivation came from, right? Yeah. Like the, the, how do how do we help people in the outlining process uh, not make that mistake that everybody makes constantly? And that was also the point of in our in the course, we separate act two into two parts, pre-midpoint and post-midpoint. And things like that where it's like it's what we were describing the whole time, but it's just a really clear way to articulate it. Um, kind of emerged after me, Adam, and John just freaking looked at this thing forever and a half and asked a bunch of questions and tried to figure it out. So I don't know. I think I think part of why it looks easy is because people don't tend to lay it lay it out easy. I think people it's over, pretty... people people get into graphs and shit, you know, and I feel like the reason why this is effective is that this is a document you can fill out on yourself, right? Yeah. You can, you can, you know, this is not a, it's, you can use it as a template to fill out your ideas as a basic first thrust to be like, okay, what's my plot going to look like? And that's such a empowering place. I think. Um, Let me see if I have some. Also the out. average temple, like a good temple is not a beat sheet. I said that last time, but I'll say it this time. A beat sheet is like a detailed outline of every single thing that happens in your movie. This is should be the essence of the movie, the core of it, following the protagonist's emotional journey. So like this should only be three pages, two to three pages max. Is this it? It is indeed. I mean, you, could turn this into a, you could turn this into a beat sheet, but I guess I can't stop you. <laughs> I can't stop anybody, but intended as a simple document that you can always go back to because beat sheets are hard to reference cross-reference this and was i'm gonna remove this real quick hang on this is when i was in john's class i don't know how easy it is to read but you see how i have p flaw in like inciting incident yeah. objective I would do this for every single one. I'd have O's as obstacles, A as antagonist. I would move the FF, final fight, ultimate test. Things were like out of order and things, but this was just me trying to make sense of everything that John would say. And I would do this for every single project. And I kept trying to tweak it, like to get all the different elements there. Yeah. And that's how I would plot out every single thing. And over time, we grew to include all the pieces. And I think it got to a place where now it's just, it, it's still what I use. I just use the better version, but it's pretty weird to look back at it and realize, oh yeah, I used to do, I used to not understand what the ultimate test was and I would put it anywhere and uh, blah, blah, blah. Hey, look at this, Adam. Yeah. I hand wrote a script. Hey, there we go. I can't even get, get that handwriting going in. Yeah, there it is. Well, I've got to go, guys. Um, yep. I've got a show I've got to go to. So, Ooh. yeah, my friend's going to play. Got to do that. Oh, nice. Yeah. All right. So, Next week, John's back. John's coming oh, yeah, on John... to talk about raising the stakes. <laughs> and yes. that's going to be a really great conversation because that is what makes your objective matter. And... There's a lot to talk about we didn't cover here uh, mm -hmm. also to talk about stakes, um, sort of philosophically how to like interrogate them and make sure they're uh, dynamic is the word. Mm, dynamic. Dynamic. All right. All right, guys. We'll see you all.